everybody do in the city? Thank you so much for the intro. Okay, I, I want Mary Sweet like as my principal, as my, my friend, as my sister, as my mom, whatever you want to be. <laughs> She's bad. <Mom>. <laughs> <laughs> She's only, crazy. I'm only 30. She's crazy. It's her birthday today, too. It is her birthday, yeah. She is. Where else would I rather be than St. Thomas Aquinas? <laughs> Um, but let us, let's do start with a prayer to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of our spirituality and our sexuality. And we ask your blessing on every family here. We ask your Holy Spirit to come and really speak through myself and Eric. Let the message that you want these parents to hear be said. And we ask um, Michael, the archangel, to defend us in this battle. Thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Whew. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm a mover and a walker, so sorry, husband, over there. You're going to have to. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about raising strong children in today's culture. And as Mrs. Sweet indicated, the culture that we're living in now is really um, sexualized and pornified. The good news, children really look to the parents as the number one influence. Studies have shown that, that the parents are the number one influence. The bad news is there's new challenges that pa um, parents are unaware of and children aren't really discussing with the parents. So what we're going to be doing tonight is really unpacking that challenge for you so you can take your rightful place as the influencer in your child's life. So we're so excited to be here. And usually my husband is not here, and so I show this. I am married to a phenomenal man. Um, Russ and I have been married almost seven, uh, 30 70. years. <laughs> almost 30 years. 
and I love, 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 love my husband. Love my husband. I'm grateful that he married me and um, he works at Learjet here in, in Wichita, still works at Learjet. And we have these eight children, literally, <laughs> I think it's like three-fourths of a ton of children. <laughs> and, you know, our older kids are the guinea pigs, you know, to all our kind of our bad parenting. If you have multiple children, you know what I mean. But the cool thing is we do get do-overs. And the reason why we're here is when um, what we share with you kind of came to light in our home, we did things radically differently and totally transformed everything. And so that's our message of hope for you tonight that you can really transform uh, your family. Hello, hello, my name is Eric. I am the oldest and easily the best looking doorman. Wow. Um, I am humble and um, I'm 24 years old. I went to Bishop Carroll in Wichita, whatever direction that's in and graduated from Kansas State University with a degree in mechanical engineering in 2015. And I was a stress engineer for two years at Spirit, working on some aeroplanes. Um, I spoke earlier today to the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders here, and it was incredible. That's probably one of the most like well-behaved and engaged groups that I have ever spoke to. So that's just props to all the parents here. That is totally your fault. It was awesome. Um, hopefully some of them forced you to come tonight or sparked your interest or said something other than this weird tall guy talked to us about porn. <laughs> anyway, I'm really glad you're here. So as mom said, uh, we are here to kind of discuss the changes happening in our culture. And the biggest by far is the internet. We live in a super connected world now. Acting out sexually or like sexual promiscuity has always been around, especially outside of marriage. But with this world that we live in, everyone has a smartphone, everyone's connected. It has never been so abundant, available, and accepted. The internet has also caused a ludicrous increase in bullying in the schools, which I talked about a little bit today. We're aware of it, but we're not explicitly going to mention in this talk here. All right, so I have a question for you parents. Um, at what age do you think um, a parent should start talking to their child about pornography, sexual things, love, lust, you know, age appropriately, but what age do you think you should begin talking to your child? 10. 10? 10. Eight. 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 What else? You guys are smiling. What are you thinking? Twelve. Yeah. The minute they can start surfing the internet. <laughs> the minute they can start surfing the internet. So That's like, a good answer. Like five. Unless they would really like at five. I mean, you have to be like you know, overwhelming the guys and doctors can yeah. just see you and things like that. So really start it at a very young age. Yeah, you can always introduce it, right? Yeah. Good. Well, um, we have some stats for you. So the average age of first exposure. Uh, Miss Sweet was talking about how. If your kids have not been exposed, they will at some point. The average age is declining. First exposure is now down to about eight years old. By the time kids are 12, 90% of them have been exposed to pornography. And when kids are in high school, it's virtually everyone. They've all seen it. So keeping those stats in mind, what we've developed for you is just basically three main objectives for tonight. We're gonna talk about why kids are being exposed to pornography so early in life. And I, I wanna just pause here a second and thank you. If you have kids who are under the age of you know, six, seven, eight, that I, this is um, a little bit harder topic for you. I know it's like kind of difficult to be here, but thank you um, because you're gonna be able to apply so much and I'm just so excited um, for parents of young kids. We're gonna look at what keeps kids viewing pornography and then at the end, some steps you can take, and we kind of have a unique system after the presentation. We're, we're gonna email you more resources, kind of like the videos we sent to you. We're gonna have emails that you can view with your child, and then be like a springboard um, for conversation. Yeah. So studies have shown that in your brain, there are two separate cognitive systems. What this means is that there are two parts of the brain that help you think and make decisions. 
There's a conscious and unconscious side. All right, so the conscious, this is what you are aware of. So conscious learning is like when your child is learning math facts. They're consciously learning that. Um, interestingly, um, the unconscious learning is a part of the brain that you're not even aware of, but that what, that's what drives most of our behaviors. So unconscious learning is kind of automatic and un like you're not even aware. It's unintentional learning. Yeah, so when you, when you walk into a room, like without even thinking, you start scanning faces wherever you are. Are you in a dangerous or safe place? This is just something your brain starts doing without even recognizing. And you react accordingly. You can tell the emotions, the tones that people have. Like, okay, I can chill. Oh, it's really funny. Oh, I'm going to kind of hold back. And it's this unconscious mind that drives behaviors and really your desire. And so that is a vital part in understanding where it fits in this puzzle of pornography. So porn is, is an intense spiritual battle. And to help your children stay away from it, you need to understand what's going on in their brain. You'll be able to help them better. We're going to show, uh, show you how your child is being exposed to all these unconscious uh, conditions. There, we live in culture, and you have so much input. Once you really understand that looking at porn or being addicted is not about being a good or bad or immoral kid, it's wired into who we are. You'll be able to really be effective with your parenting, with your kids. So like I said, your child's in a spiritual battle for their soul. Thank you guys for being here tonight. I really hope I, I sparked a couple of fires and some kids earlier today, and hopefully that pushed on to you, and thank you. All right, so the unconscious conscious um, condition, we're just gonna share our story and I want you to think about how that plays out in our story and, and then think about your own family, how you are raising your kids and how that is playing out with your children. Um, so basically I gave birth to Eric um, July 4th, so I lost my independence in 1993. <laughs> These are not a picture of his toes because his toes were so large, they did not fit on the ink pad. <laughs> like, yeah, I had newborn clothes and I had to take them all back and get four month old clothes <laughs> for my 23 inch, 10 and a half pound firstborn child. Sorry. <laughs> you know, but even though he was, you know, this very large, kid, I love, love, love my child. And he was helpless and I just started nurturing him and all the protective instincts kind of kicked in. Um, very quickly we had number two and then number three. And so um, I loved being a mom. Um, my husband has allowed me to be a stay-at-home mom. I stopped teaching at that point, um, you know, when it, after Eric was born. And we just moved, to Saint, moved from St. Louis to Wichita, and I took my kids to the library and to you know, parks, and we did all these fun things, and it was just you know, ordinary living. Eric was an ordinary child. He drove me crazy. Like, he peed in the closet once. I do not know what that was about, but... You were mad at me. <laughs> well, that helped. <laughs> I mean, just ordinary things, but he also had this thirst for holiness. I saw it as a young kid and I, I was so um, enamored by that aspect of his personality. And like when he received First Communion, he was a second grader, he knew that was Jesus. And just the way he attended. And then, um, I don't know, I was just so, I kind of felt like I should drop the mic sometimes because like I've arrived. And he was like about fifth, sixth grade, he started being an altar server. We lived at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton at that time with, was it Father Billinger? Yes. And so he would like ride his bike over, you know, to serve. And it was like at that point that Lori Dornaman started the beatification process for Eric. <laughs> Scott Dornaman. And the idea that I would talk to him about pornography or sexual things, you know, it, I thought about it, but I did not want to ruin his innocence. And he was so into the God scene, I just thought that that was enough. And we were happy. So everything mom said was absolutely true. She was dope, I was dope. Okay, dope. <laughs> we had an awesome time. We went to tons of parks. One of my favorite was the Rocket Park, 
when we went there, you could actually go to the top of it. They hadn't welded it shut yet. And it was just, it was fun. Um, my side of that story is a little bit different. So mom always talked about God. We never missed a Sunday mass. We ate together every night as a family. We prayed the rosary consistently-ish. And I heard this message, but I was overwhelmed by everything else. There was so much on TV that I, I didn't really understand what was happening. In the music scene, have you ever listened to the lyrics that are just on the radio? It's nuts. My, my classmates were talking about stuff on the playground and I was seeing advertisements, a little cleavage here, a little leg there. And it seemed like happiness, all you needed was a big truck and a beautiful woman. And I totally bought that. I was receiving all of this, and then my classmates did this really, really awesome, funny thing where one day I looked, and they were like all there talking back to me, and I looked over, and then looked back, and they were beautiful. <laughs> and I noticed. <laughs> and uh, I had a lot of questions. I had all this input. My classmates were, I was feeling all these things, and I knew for sure I could not ask my parents because all they ever did was talk about God and I had a bunch of sex questions and I was like, nah, those don't really fit together. So this was about 2005-ish uh, and we had a new best friend and his name was Google. And you could ask Google anything and Google would give you the answer. Uh, for those of you that remember, there was Ask Jeeves also. Uh, he wasn't as cool as Google though. So I just asked away and I started searching. and. Because we lived in a house with no filtering and no monitoring of our computer, I found way more than I ever intended to, very quickly. And I just kept searching, learning, if you will. Over time, my searches became uh, less and less innocent, more graphic. And a couple years later, uh, I started masturbating. I had all these like new feelings and emotions that I did not know what they were, but I didn't really care because they felt good. And my parents didn't know. It got to the point where I was looking at porn multiple times a week, every week. I mean, my classmates, we would, we would just joke about it, just back and forth. Puberty is a hoot when you have the internet. It was a couple of years before I even realized that this stuff was immoral. I didn't know. I saw parts of the female body before I knew what they were called. All right, so at this point, if you would have asked me what was going on in the Dornaman home, I would have just told you phenomenal things, great things. Um, this little girl, uh, Malaysia, needed a home. She was four, and so we adopted her. And there's just a lot of different things that was going on really positive. I um, now try to eat really healthy, but at that point, we, we made a lot of cookies. And we I'm were glad baking. I got out in time for that transition. <laughs> <laughs> we were baking a lot and, and doing things. Uh, the, the little kids loved the big kids, literally hanging all over them. And you know, when my kids drew pictures, this is the kind of stuff they drew. You know, who, who drew, is that a Cairo? That's the Divine Mercy thing. No, like the Cairo, is that the Oh Cairo? yeah, yeah. Like, who does that? Like, you know, who draws stuff like that? And My so little brother has a tattooed on his chest. <laughs> <laughs> so I just felt like, you know, we're on the right track. God is the center of our lives. And if someone would have said, you know what? There is a spiritual battle of epic propor proportions in your home and, you know, evil is winning. I would not have agreed. That's not what I knew. And then one day I was bringing some sheets down in Eric's room and I found him um, viewing pornography. That's how I found out. Yeah, I think, I think I remember the exact day, hour, minute, and second that that happened. Uh, I did not expect it. I, I freaked out. 
What you guys need to know about that night is that, that all that shame that just got poured all over my soul was not really a new feeling. I've been looking for a long time. I knew this stuff was immoral, but I kept doing it. I was used to like this temptation and excitement and then the fall and then the, am I a good person? The one thing that, that kind of changed is there's this additional layer. I brought my mom into that shame. I wondered what, what the heck would happen next? Would, would she ground me for all of eternity? Would she like throw away everything I owned? Or the absolute worst, would she pretend nothing happened and never talk about it? So that became, um, it was the lowest point of my life. I had this huge spiritual uh, breakdown, I would call it. And how I handled it is I just kind of pulled back. and didn't really talk to Eric, didn't really talk to my husband, and we, I just, I didn't know, I just felt like everything that I had done, like, um, I guess I had pride in my mothering, and how do you go about talking about this? Like, this is my kid, and he's been consuming porn for a long time, and how had that happened on my watch? And so, um, eventually, about two weeks later, my husband and I really started talking, and it opened up communication between him and I, and we had to go through um, kind of awakening in our own marriage and just talking about really hard topics together. And then we had to decide what we were going to do with Eric, because I knew that he had such a center that was a really moral fiber, so I knew that there was more to this story. So I just kind of put Eric on hold. Um, I, I didn't know how to filter a home. I did not know how to, so we took the computer away, but that, I didn't know what else to do. I started doing some research. I went to the library. I started reading, um, getting lots and lots of books and just started understanding the brain, um, pornography, addiction, and, and all that kind of stuff. And at the beginning of this presentation, we uh, told you that We were going to talk about why kids are exposed so early in life. Can you understand why that happened in my home? You know, because I didn't talk to him. Who really taught my son about his sexuality? Who do you say, who would you think formed him? Yeah. Basically, the world, it's, Google, friends, yeah. And it's not, I mean, Google is a bland thing. The sex industry formed my child. You know, that kind of hit me smack right in the soul. And so, age eight is now this exposure to this because our kids are receiving all sorts of input from lots of different sources, but also there's like, um, I think it was in 2015, we found out that there's 26 million porn sites. And so they're after our kids in, in a way that, you know, he, he had his issues. There was not even smartphones, you know? And now it's, it's even ramped up, um, even, even more so than you were, wouldn't you say? Yeah, when I, when I was in high school, if you're lucky enough to have a laptop or computer, uh, you still had to sneak around at night or like, Wi-Fi wasn't as good, nothing, it was way less accessible. So one question we want to ask you um, is, um, it's kind of a weird question, but why is porn wrong? Um, because when we give presentations, there's two extremes. There's people who think that porn is terrible, horrible, no good, like worse than murder. And there's people way over here that think it's fine. It's a part of life. But by and large, the most of the people that we talk to, they don't have an opinion about it because they don't want to talk about it and they don't want to think about it. And so what we're going to do is invite you. We're going to come up with <laughs> reasons. Like, why is it wrong? Now, you guys know it's wrong, right? <laughs> so why? Yeah, just toss some stuff out. 
They're not as loud as today's. You're, uh, the kids today, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders today, were killing it. <laughs> because it turns a person into just an object. Yep. Okay, it turns a person into an object. Makes you, it makes you see what, not who. It defies the marriage covenant. It How defies so? the marriage How covenant. How does it defy the marriage covenant? covenant. Good, so it takes sex that should be in marriage and takes it out. Which sort of what Marie said, but then kind of, it profanes something that's holy. Yeah. It can lead to other, other sins. It can lead to other sins, and mm -hmm. like what? If you're a sixth grader and you're addicted to pornography, what could it lead to when you're in sixth grade? Or seventh grade, or eighth grade? Because you are phone. right, it is leading to other things, but like what other things? Lying, fighting, lying. You know, just in general. Yeah, I, I was a very good actor when I was in junior high school. And what? It can lead to sex. Yep. What, what, what more specifically even, especially with smartphones and Snapchat, if you've heard of what Snapchat is? Photos that disappear after 10 seconds? Good promiscuity. Good, and, and the reason why we want you to really think about this, we will not stop this train by being lukewarm. You know, if you were just go, oh yeah, porn's a thing, it, it'll keep continuing. So we need to really have an opinion about it. Um, I, in the middle of this, I kind of just gave up emotionally a little bit because I thought, my kid, he's, you know, been a consumer of porn. I don't know what to do about it. I don't really know anything. And so I can't control him. Therefore, I kind of just did this. And my good friend, Mary Lee, she was like, oh no, Lori. And she really got in my face. She's a, a counselor by trade. And she's like, Lori, do you understand how wrong pornography is? And I'm like, yeah, it's lust. And you know, if you look at someone with lust in your eyes, you've committed a sin. And she says, no, do you understand it's wrong? And I, I, I just said, well, tell me, why is it so wrong? Just inform me. And she just um, had been, knew a girl who knew a girl that got into pornography. And this girl, uh, Dawn, when she got into pornography, she lasted about three months in, in the porn scene. And in those three months, she had to do really hard drugs just to perform these um, sex acts and do all the stuff that she was asked to do. And Mary Lee looked at me and she just said, Lori, that ruined Dawn. Physically, it ruined her. And she told me graphically how it ruined her. And then she said it emotionally and spiritually just, you know, ripped all that up too. And as she talked, it put a face to it. And I realized that that girl is a child of God and it, um, it just made something come to life in Lori Dornaman. And it was at that moment that I said, no, like not on my watch, not in my home. And that's when I got kind of vigilante about everything. So if I, I was asked that question in high school and I don't know if I had like a really good, solid answer. Why is porn wrong? The church says it's wrong. It's a moral sin. Every, everything I heard, it objectifies women. It's not a victimless crime. It's all these things. I, at the end of the day, I didn't care. It was just me. No one really knew about it. But now that I'm older and I have more experience, I look back. And the biggest issue with pornography is that it completely separates a human's body and soul. When you look at a naked person, especially someone you don't even know, you can't see into their heart. There is no emotional connection. And as a result, this will turn this amazing sex drive you had from God and turn it inward rather than outward. It preaches, it, it reinforces this selfish, selfish love. It causes a huge divide between the addict and everything else. Porn also overstimulates, and it creates a super craving that 
can really only be satisfied by more of this fantasy world porn. This is <clears throat> why so many addicts, especially male addicts, struggle keeping it up during sex, especially the college demographic. They all look at porn or they need the lights to be off. Maybe it's just boring, just one woman. You're used to this crazy stimulation and you go have sex and you can't. Like all addictions, it creates this ever-growing craving, but it starts with such a natural attraction. Like when I was back in middle school, I literally Googled beautiful women and I was just blown away by the beauty. But that grew over time into something that if I looked back a few years ago, I would have thought was atrocious. That cycle confused the hell out of me because this was something so wrong, but I kept wanting it. I literally asked a priest in confession one time. I said, how do I stop doing something that I like doing? I was genuinely convinced that I liked it. That's how deep it was in my heart. If it would have been easy to stop the night that mom walked in on me, I would have been done. But there's more to that. And I know as Catholics, it's like, it's really easy to pin it on the head. This is a moral issue. It's a sin. And yeah, I agree. It definitely starts off like that. But there is so much more to this story. Mm -hmm. So as um, Eric and I started, well, actually, as I started doing research, um, I really discovered what keeps kids viewing porn. I was able to explain it to him, and we're going to go over that really quick now. But as we were talking and researching, I was like, this is me, this is my brain. And he's like, mother, do not confuse all this. I just, was like, let's focus. Just... <laughs> but I have a sugar addiction, big. And um, everything that we're gonna go through happens in my brain with sugar. And so it was awesome. It was a freeing thing to understand this cycle. So if you cannot associate and you're like, this porn thing is so way out there, think of your own addiction. You probably have an addiction to maybe social media or to gossip or to um, some type of food, maybe to alcohol, but it's all addictions work the same in the brain. And, but this right here is what keeps um, kids viewing pornography. So there's four main happiness chemicals in the, in the brain. And for simplicity's sake, for time's sake, we're going to just talk about one. We have an online course where we go over this in way more detail, but, um, I love dopamine. <laughs> this is what is the pleasure and survival hormone. So basically, whenever you do anything that is related to intense pleasure and intense, like helping you survive, that's when the dopamine floods your brain. And so um, basically, our food supply and our sex supply, do you think they've changed in the last 50 years? our food supply. So, um, <laughs> that's what happens when we eat and we have sex. Just, ah! <laughs> Now this is super important to understand. So in your brain, just looking at your brain, sex and porn are kind of scary similar. The brain does not have a moral code about how an orgasm happened. It just knows it happened and it freaks out and it loves it. It doesn't really care how. But your brain knows, hey, that's sex. I, that's needed for survival. And so it starts to fight to protect whatever caused that to happen. One of the most accurate definitions of an addiction is the misattribution of an important process in the brain. <laughs> it's when your brain thinks something that's not needed for survival is. When it incorrectly says, I need this to survive, I'm going to protect this. That's when some issues start to arise. 
All right, so dopamine um, is released in anticipation of uh, pleasure. So um, when a child is addicted to pornography, just holding the phone releases dopamine. Um, for me, just um, anytime I was near, like my husband loves chocolate, and sometimes just going into his office where I knew there was chocolate, I would just start that dopamine thing. Sometimes if you're driving down the street and your kids all of a sudden they're hungry, but they're seeing the golden arches and they just ate. So those are all triggers and that's what, how dopamine works. It's actually in anticipation of pleasure. And those, and those triggers can really be anything. Uh, one of the big ones for me in college was coming home and knowing my roommates were gone. Or late at night when you're just scrolling through Facebook and you see something comes up you didn't expect necessarily. These can either be uh, something mental, like something that elicits an, a feeling of unworthiness or you're put down. Your brain is like, oh, I know, I know something that can fix this. And dopamine starts to get showered all over your brain just in anticipation. And this is huge because you flip to autopilot. You are now in, go get that, I need that. Without even thinking, you're scrolling through Facebook and then you land on a porn site. I use that example specifically because from my own experience, and I've talked to many, many Catholic high school and college kids, we're kind of ashamed of this sin. Like consciously, you're like, this is a sin. It's not good. Like, and it's interesting. Maybe you won't hop directly onto a porn site, but you'll scroll through Facebook because you know you'll find something that'll just trigger it. And then when that happens, it's just every part of you wants to hop over and it's really easy to make that switch. At this stage in the game, when someone's viewing a lot of porn, the brain is doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's pumping out loads and loads of dopamine. It's enjoying what you're giving it. It's literally having a party. Okay, Catholic crowd, here's our dopamine receptors. <laughs> so we have a little analogy, a wine analogy for you with dopamine and... We, we get... had sciencey things, but they were really boring looking. <laughs> we also gave this talk to a uh, non-Catholic like, Christian crowd <laughs> and the pastor was like, grape juice? <laughs> so in your brain, you have these neuron receptors. And that's what these wine glasses are. And the wine is the dopamine. What the neuron receptors do is they transfer the dopamine all throughout your brain and throughout your entire body. Now, pornography, it's a super stimulus. So you now have a higher alcohol content wine. And when you're viewing a ton of it, you're just pouring it everywhere. You're loving it. You're having a party. The name of the game is pleasure. But the brain, because... It wants to keep us in balance. We'll just say this is a little excessive and we'll actually remove some of the receptors. So your brain is brilliant. It knew you were having way too much. So the brain will take away some of those wine glasses. Boom, perfect balance. You can't have too much now. Well, there is an issue with that. It's dopamine's not just received when you look at porn or have sex or masturbate. It's a happiness chemical, it's really complex. And so life can start to kind of become dull. You only really mark your day as a success when you do these things that are hypersensitive. Another challenge is without as many receptors, your same feel good hit can't be achieved. Less glasses, same craving. You can see where this is starting to go. So this is, you play this little game where you fill it up to the rim as much as you can fit in there. You start looking at, at things online that maybe at one point you thought were atrocious. This is how it grows and grows. Maybe you start looking at porn at inappropriate times of the day, at work, when the kids are home, when your parents are home, when your brother's right next to you. I shared a room when mom caught me. Anything for that hit. Now, at some point in this process, you may start to freak out, like you really feel your moral pathway slipping, and you try to quit. But the brain, it's, it's in survival mode, it isn't always. And it incorrectly thinks that this porn stuff is sex. 
and I need to protect this. So if you try to stop, it's going to do everything that it can to keep it coming in. The porn user will experience this as severe withdrawal symptoms. And this can be anything from headaches, body aches, anxiety, anger. And these can only be relieved when you look at more porn. There's one point in college where me and my friends had this like accountability group where we did this like literally a slap bet where we text each other if we fell and it was a group of four guys and if you fell the other three that day next time they saw you they would pull you aside and slap you in the face as hard as they could and it was just a trigger like to try to get us to stop and that week my body hated me I felt awful and I got to a point where I was like you know what I don't care I don't care if I get slapped, this is gonna keep, I'm gonna keep doing this. So Eric would come home from college and by this time we were communicating and talking and he would you know, talk to me about his um, inability to get out. And you know, I would, what frustrated me is this kid who was so godly, could not even let God in. God wasn't, wasn't part of his life. He was still going through the motions, but he was kind of dead inside. And what I learned is if you are really in the addictive cycle like this, you cannot really be living God's plan of life and love. You just can't. So I spent about 10 years trying to fight my desire for pornography. Telling myself it was immoral, why do I keep doing this? 10 years of dealing with that shame, just building up more and more and more. It was in college where I really started to like, I had one really hard conversation with mom where I was just like, I do not know if I'm like, at my core, can I be a good person? Like, yeah, sure, I made the kids laugh today. I played with them a lot, but like, I go home and do this all the time. What does that say about me when no one's around? And I kind of had this like whole identity just crisis. That all changed after college when I started learning about my brain and addiction. What addiction is, it's not just a porn habit, it is a physical addiction. And I started learning about the conscious and unconscious mind. By changing my unconscious mind, realigning it with my conscious mind, I was able to transition out of this. And I'll lose her, your course. It was. <laughs> what blew me away is that forever I was looking for the strength to say no. I remember in seventh and eighth grade, I said, Oh, high schoolers don't look at porn. I'll, I'll, ha I'll be strong enough and like adultish enough to say no then. That was wrong. And then I was like, oh, in college, I'll be in college. I, I won't look at porn in college. Like, pfft, no one looks at porn in college. Yeah, I was wrong. And I graduated. I'm like, I'm an actual adult now. No porn. And for a little while, I was very wrong. It's when I changed that unconsciousness, the really drive where, that made me ask that priest, how do I quit doing something that I love? that I really enjoy. When I removed that, I allowed God to come in and I like heard him as audibly as you can, like I've been waiting. And what's so different now is that I don't need the strength to say no. Uh-oh, 7%. I think. Did we unplug it? No, I think it just is right behind. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, it's just hanging there. Perfect. I remember the exact moment in adoration where I heard those words from God, like, I've been waiting for this moment. The question isn't even there anymore. I'm trying to teach my friends and people that I love and convince them that, like, it's not about getting the strength to say no. It's completely changing your core, who you are. 
and I let God in, and I have this new fire. Like, I smile more. I talk about God more to my friends. I've never done that. I think I freaked out my little brother. <laughs> and to his siblings, was... they're like, what, what's up with Eric? <laughs> yeah, I freaked out my little brother because we had, like, a fire pit in my house, and, like, the whole time I talked about God, and he was like, what's wrong with you? I just want to play Call of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> and... I will say that none of this at all would have been possible. This transformation that I had without parents. Specifically, my parents. I said that weird. My parents never shamed me throughout any of this. I have a lot of friends whose parents think they're pieces of shit because they look at porn. And they shame them. Why would you do this? You know what your little siblings see you as, right? And that shuts them down and makes the problem worse. I thank God that my parents like, took that time to step back, figure themselves out. They learned, they actually taught themselves about this addictive cycle so they could help me as much as they could. Thank you. They're the reason I'm standing here today a new person with this new fire in front of me. And I hope that we can transform our culture because the way the road that they're on now is is scary. I love working with my son. He's a little passionate. It's kind of exciting to, to work with him. But really, right now, you know, if you have younger kids, you are just in the calm waters. If you have older kids, there's rapids beyond this bend, and you know that. Um, but what you have to do, like if you are in the calm or if you are already in the rapids, what you really need to do is decide. Are you going to be one of the parents that really enters into this because you are the number one influence for your child? Are you going to help them? And Eric and I have spent a year developing an online course as a resource for you, which we will offer to you eventually. We are going to send you tons of free resources, so we will give you the things you need to say. That's not going to be the problem. But are you willing to do the work with your kid? And basically, people are always like, well, what do I need to do? Well, number one, this is a spiritual battle, and we're entering Lent. So really, um, get on your knees. This is a war that's... The amount of rosaries I said for this child, um, I found out about the Rosary of Seven Sorrows. That became my favorite. I did novenas for him. And I asked Our Lady for the Grace that this issue would basically be um, make his life better than even if it had not occurred. Like create in him such power because of this. You know, beauty out of ashes. And so today, when he was talking to the junior high kids, I just was like so moved within my soul that the, my prayer had been answered so powerfully because he's now this evangelist. I mean, he left spirit as an engineer to do this. You know, he's devoted you know, his whole life to this um, ministry. So I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And then filter. How many of you guys have... Um, have an inter internet filter. Holy cow. Uh, how, how, of those of you that raise your hand, is it Covenant Eyes or is it something else? Have you heard of Covenant Eyes? Yeah. yeah? Was the majority of it not? No? So um, we've researched a lot of different companies, and one of our favorites out there is Covenant Eyes. I actually have a handout that will give you more, that will give you a, little bit, little, a few more details on it. Um, it's a filtering and accountability service. So filtering is just an internet filtering. It flags every website uh, on an age group from mature to like child, and it'll block certain websites. Um, the accountability side is just kind of a fancy way of saying monitoring. You get reports. So what happens is when you set up an account, it's, uh, I think it's about $15 a month, and you get unlimited users, unlimited devices. So what that looks like in our family is we have a bajillion kids, and each kid is their own user, 
and each user has a few devices. Like I think I have five. Like I have a phone, a couple laptops, maybe an old phone. And if I look at anything on any of those devices, my um, well, accountability, accountability. But it's really funny because we look up different things, you know, for and our researching work. porn. So, and I, get, so I get flags all the time. And then, but I when just she like, gets a flag, she texts me. She's like, "Bro, what's up? <laughs> I, are you are you are you okay?" He's like, "Yes, mother, I was. I'm okay, okay, just." But um, with uh, the filtering. Like my friend, she said, Lori, I'm so grateful to you for that you suggested Kevin at Eyes because her child, actually two of my friends, their children got up in the middle of the night and got out their iPads and Googled something they'd heard on the classroom, uh, in the, on the playground. And so um, it filtered it. And then my friend got you know, dinged that someone was looking at something at one in the morning and so she could have a conversation. So that's why the accountability is really cool. And and then one last reason that we love Covenant Eyes, uh, they are ahead of the game with their iPhone app and as well as their Android app, mainly their iPhone. It is the first like accountability app, filtering app, that'll go into other apps, like go in the background. So most programs like NetNanny, there's X3 Watch out there, you have to use a dedicated browser that they provide. That's how you search the internet, that's how they filter it. Covenant Eyes is the first one that lets you like use Safari and Chrome, and it'll still filter and provide accountability. So there, what's up? On the iPhone, so you can click private, does it? It'll, it'll get the incognito browsers too. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Um, and then also their customer service is like, every time you call them, there's no- You get a person. There's no, you don't hit five for the option. It's like you get a human like every time. And it's, there's always issues that arise up with these tech things. And so it's nice just having a person. And they'll spend you. hours with you if you need them to. They'll, they'll um, remote into your computer and they can help you in every step of the way. So that's why I highly recommend them. We've become an affiliate with them, so we're gonna give you a um, flyer and there is a promo code. Uh, you'll get a free month if you use it and then we'll get a little thank you from them. So we appreciate that. Um, I do wanna say that with our gazillion kids, this, uh, so I have two freshmen, and they just got one phone between them, and it, it's this one. <laughs> My senior has a flip phone, and Mitchell, he's uh, in his third year at Conception. He had an Android, but he just said, Mom, there's too many ways I can get around that. So he went back to a flip phone. And I just asked him, you know, because we're very open, and how did you get around things? And you can go through social media, you can go through the back door, you can go through bravery, his bravery, you can find different open ways. So um, social media apps, it's a gateway to porn. So if I had a child, I would not give, I have a child. My children do not have smartphones, and if they had smartphones, I would not put apps like Snapchat, I would not have Instagram, I would not have Facebook, I would not have Pinterest on their phone. If they wanted to use those things, of course they could not do Snapchat on the home computer, but I would let them be on the home computer and me in the house if they wanted to have an Instagram account or whatever. But it is too dangerous and there are too many things going on. So, and then the other thing we recommend that you do, the third step, is just to guide them, walk with them. And like we said, we're gonna, this is what we'll do with you, we'll help walk with you. But what kind of questions do you have about anything that Eric and I talked about. Um, pornography is a problem for girls too. About 30% of users are girls, and in college it turns up more like almost 70% of girls are using pornography. So it's not a boys only issue. No questions? Yes. How long have we been doing this? Um, we've been giving presentations for about a year and a half together. Um, I was giving presentations by myself, and Eric said, Mom, you need me. <laughs> so she, she doesn't know how to work computers. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I just wanted to stay She's home learning. More, She's and, learning. Um, that's why we created the online course, so we could give people really one-on-one -on -one care, and you could learn stuff, how to talk effectively in your home, and then I didn't have to leave my home. So that's kind of why we did that, and I needed him for that. Um, you mentioned Pinterest, and I know that I've seen different things. Is that interesting? Is that similar? I mean, is that right? Instagram, where Instagram, 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Pinterest is blocked on all my computers. So there's, there's users, um, they just put nasty boards up. But that's like kind of any social media site. A lot of websites will take them down eventually. I love Pinterest. And so what my girls, when they want to get on their Pinterest account, they do it when I'm in the kitchen. We have one computer, it's in the kitchen. And so um, it's off. And that's, that's kind of the game you have to play with these social media apps especially. There's, I, I don't know of an app that can like go into Instagram and block like all the bikini pictures or whatever. So you need to make a decision. Is this something, is Snapchat something I'm gonna allow in my home? They're sending their own pornography through Snapchat. Do you want your child doing that? And it's so much easier to say, no, you can't have this, rather than, no, you need to take it off now. Like if you cut it before it, you even allow them to have yeah, it. Yeah, so it's preschool so families, easier. I'm like, yes, please come to our presentation because you will really be happy because it's harder to take it off. But yeah. we have taken it off. Um, Older, older kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes? How do you approach your child if you suspect something about like offending them if they're innocent or about putting something into their head that's not there? At what age? My son's 14 now. And then my son's Yeah. Okay, so a 14 year old son, I 100% guarantee you he has been looking at pornography. I, at least seen it. I, I'm, I'm sure he's at least seen it. And so what you need to do, you want to, do, you want to go, you want to handle this? Well, you need to create an environment that's safe, first of all, and warn them that you're going to talk to him. I'm going to talk to you about, I went to this great presentation and I learned a lot of different things. Yeah, well, oh, you don't yeah. want to make him defensive. Yeah. So there's just, there's just different steps to take. Um, we, we have tons of videos in our isn't course that, isn't exactly that one of the on this. What? Is the steps you take one of the emails, like with the setting up a... Uh -huh. oh. um, so I sent a PDF originally as a resource, but it's better in video. So we have videos on our course. But basically, amnesty, that I adore you, and nothing that you say will be going on my Facebook account. You know, <laughs> that it's just between you and I. And then what I would also do is talk to him about your own struggles. That's big. So this is a thing that... Um, when I was a senior in high school, one of the ways my mom and dad helped me is they opened up about their own struggles. Just they made sure struggles. that I realized, <laughs> I'm not going into details. No, they made sure that I realized that like, it's not just you, we're all sexual beings. Like I understand like, as a culture, this is happening. If the average age of first exposure is this, and you're older than this, I'm just going to assume. And I am so sorry that I have not protected you from this. And maybe that's your only conversation you have that night. And we're going to be doing something called filtering, and I'm going to be having conversations with you. I'm going to walk with you. I love you. It's a really, it's a hard conversation to have. And there will most likely be backlash, especially if they already have a phone that is completely unfiltered. They will thank you down the road. Yeah, and just my never... siblings hated her well, for I a few months because hate is a strong word. <laughs> because she said no smartphones, no phones. My freshman sisters just got one of them just got a flip phone, and one night they said thanks, mom. Like. Because their we friends are sending on. lots of bad stuff. I mean, it just is happening. Um, I also would not ever ask a yes or no question. Have you seen porn? That's a yes or no question. I would not ask that question. Because they'll, they'll most likely try to protect themselves, and then they're going to lie. They will separate from you to protect you and to protect themselves. So just you know, help them understand, I get this. I'm on your side. We're together. We're a team. I'll walk with you. We'll figure this out. I'm going to learn a lot of new stuff. And showing them that like, you care, you want to help them in any way possible. You're not alone in this fight. If they're a Catholic kid, I assume they have this moral dilemma going on, this dissonance in their head. This is bad. I shouldn't be doing this. I keep doing this. I kind of like it. Yeah. 
And so the message we really want you parents to hear is just love. You're just going to lavish love and unconditional love. And it, take, it takes a long time to grow kids. And for their, um, that part of their brain to develop fully, he's almost 25 and it's finally developed. You know, I've been walking this road a long time with him and just do a lot of good self-care for you. And also, if there's any of you that think that you might like have an out because I talked to some of your kids earlier today, I told them that, hey, oh, yeah. some of your parents are coming to a conversation tonight. They will be talking to you. <laughs> Yes. What kind of other than the um, covenant eyes, what other resources or things did you find helpful in bridging that technology gap? Oh. And that you're not real computer savvy, but he is. Yeah. Uh -huh. you have, you know, kids of a certain age, they're oh. probably very. Yeah. You know what I said to Eric? He should have a second job and just go to people's homes and work by the hour and put all this stuff on their equipment. Ugh. I mean, don't you guys think that would be awesome? <laughs> I charge a lot. <laughs> no, so one resource, um, it's called Open DNS. Open and then DNS. Um, and what this is, it's a setting that you can change on your router. It's completely free. And uh, we go over it as a, as a resource on the course and on our website. It will block adult websites. There's also a version, if you create an account, you can make a custom list of websites it'll, blocked. it'll block. It's a setting on your Wi-Fi router. So any device connected to your Wi-Fi router at home, you won't be able to access adult websites. So where Covenant Eyes stinks, like on Xbox, PlayStation, Wii, and smart TVs, because that's just hard, OpenDNS will overlay those. Now, why we don't say only open DNS, you don't need Covenant Eyes, is because you can just do the flip on your smartphone and hop on data. So open DNS is really good in your home with um, protecting all those devices that Covenant Eyes can't really have. And, and, the, and their website has tutorials that, depending on what router you have, the settings are a little different. It's, it's a setting. What yeah, it's a, a setting and it's free. What a DNS is, is it's basically a phone book for your internet. And so when you, when you type in like facebook.com, the internet actually calls an IP number. It's like a phone number, just the same way that your phone, when I call Lori, it punches the digits in. So the phone book is like that list. And open DNS, it just, it's a new list that it provides that says, you can't go to this website or this website or this website. Yes. And the thing also with that, it's not a filtering. So you, you, you'll either be able to access the website or not. It won't, it won't filter content on a website it allows. And there's so, so like, much. So you could find Swimsuit Edition on ESPN, but it won't allow like really nasty websites. Um, so there's so much that we haven't talked about. What happens when your kids go to babysitting, you know, overnights, grandma's house, all that kind of stuff. And that's why we cr created the Parenting Dare. You can follow us on Facebook, and then again, we'll send you more information about that. But if you could fill out that, that email list, that piece of paper, borrow a pen, I guess. And yeah, then, um, and just the tables right by the door when you guys signed in, if you leave those there, uh, we will send you all those resources. We have about five emails worth of resources that are to just kind of help you start conversations in your house. Good. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Probably more for you. For sure. Um, so we have like a 10 year old fifth grader. Yeah. What are some of the key like conversation starters? Like if he's having conversation with his friends, what kind of stuff can we pick up on that maybe that he's having? That are they having this like around you? Like you literally are like no, hear no, it no, or like at, at school or yeah. at a sleepover or something like that? <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, we're, our house is pretty un eventful as far as technology goes and we keep it that way but sure. obviously you go on the playground you go to a friend's house there's more exposure mm -hmm. they, are there keys i guess obviously it would be something yeah. that would be tried to keep secret but so one of the biggest things see or pick up on? are there oh like that you can notice kind of yeah, something that we can notice that, like a physical sign even, or maybe an action, is super hard. I, we, we gave a talk to like high school teachers and they, like the principal asked like, is there a physical tell 
if a high schooler is looking at porn? And I was just like, no. If they're a high schooler. There's, there, there's <laughs> I, I talked with a friend, because I, I like asked their opinions, and he's like, oh, dude, no, yeah, I got one. If you have like a group of high schoolers, and they're seniors especially, they all look at it. They all talk about it. But the thing is, what I would just do to protect your kids is I do not do overnights. That's a huge place where they are, get exposed to pornography. I would talk to your principal. Make sure that there's great filters on. You know, uh, talk with your computer people. What kind of filters? Are they getting you know, iPads from school? I mean, all these different places. And then talk to your kid. If it's a fifth grader, just say, hey, we went to a presentation. We, we were going to talk to you every week about this. And like, have you seen anything that's make you feel uncomfortable or whatever? And if they're just no shut down, start throwing a couple things out, explaining what they are. It's better you introduce it than they learn about it somewhere else. Like, that's worst case, right? And then, then they'll start to, oh, he gets it a little bit odd. And there, this is a book. Have you guys seen um, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures? Been exposed to this picture, uh, book? Um, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures is just a, a just very simple, easy way to introduce pornography. And they have one called jun Junior Edition for kids who are more like kindergarten and preschoolers. So um, any other questions? I know it's... I have just one question. Um, you were talking about Covenant Eyes, but then you said if you go into apps, but you can't go into social media apps. Is that so, that's a good question. No, that is a good question. So sh social media websites, they're, I have not yet heard of a, any internet filter that can really monitor that stuff like Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest that'll like block out certain posts. That's much harder. Covenant Eyes is working on a technology that instead of having a database of things that are inappropriate that it looks for, it'll scan the screen. Like it'll start to pick up what is on the screen and that's how it starts reading. Like that's starting to get more into AI stuff, but it's really cool just the direction that- But what you can do with Covenant Eyes, let's say your kid deletes history, Covenant Eyes sends you a report and you can say, my child was on Facebook for three hours from midnight to 3 a.m. You know, so you can understand if it's not. Yeah, you can tell you, it tells you how long and where they visited. That, that will start to filter the will within filter, the app? It'll, it'll filter uh, currently Do you know the name of, the, of one of them? There's a couple out there, but ultimately, um, for, for us, we decided not to. So the product that we yeah. use is called RPAC Junior, and I haven't checked the, the Covenant Eyes for mm -hmm. RPAC Junior. So we have a 14 year old all the way down to sure. 3 year old. So we had things from specific apps we didn't want the kids to be on, uh, all the way down to time limits. And so that product allowed certain apps mm -hmm. and also set time limits. And so I just thought I'd share that with yeah. you. It's called Junior. It doesn't require you to jailbreak the phone and it also doesn't allow, it does require you to put it on your router. So you also have to be careful mm -hmm. with that because sometimes that- Di Disney you. Circle does something similar to that also. It's, it's, That's really good. It's better than Circle and it, it's, it's okay. less cool. foggy on your service. So just, it's just another option for parents mm -hmm. when you have a range of kids who have different needs. Mm -hmm. um, Right. Mm -hmm. So you want to find whatever filter you do have that has the different individualized stuff so you can block them. Yeah, let's get one more and then we'll just we'll chill up here until gotcha. everyone's gone. How did you approach your family when this situation broke out with the rest of your kids? Did you I didn't. I just cried. She cried a lot. <laughs> um, I just became so different and I just started talking. I'm like, we're talking about porn in here. <laughs> you know, we just are. And so we just talk, and now our um, kid who's in the seminary, if he becomes a priest, his name's Mitch, he's taller than him. Um, he's a tall seminarian, so if you see, like... The, he, the Wichita poster of seminarians, he's like... He's always in the back, and he's always the tallest. But he, like, took his door off of his room, you know, and he talks about pornography all the time. And he goes, well, we're the porn family. I said... <laughs> Stop we, it! <laughs> we are the anti-porn family, honey. <laughs> but he just said, Mom, no one talks about it. No one talks about it. And, and that's, so, that's why we're here. We're just starting the conversation. Yeah, just start talking about it. When your kid goes to somebody else's house, ask, hey, do you have any guns or open, you know, open computers in your house? 
You know, how, how, will they be using the computer? So, all right, that's fantastic. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Did you have anything you wanted to add? Perfect. Fantastic. Yeah, all right. we'll, we'll chill up here. If you've got any questions you want to ask either and of us. And just leave those on the back table, and we'll be getting those resources in the next couple of days.